Dr. Sharam Dana. Unfortunately, Carolyn uh, uh, Evans, our um, Vice Chancellor, was going to speak here and uh, has prepared an address has been prepared for her to deliver, Australia but unfortunately possible. Yeah. So I'm delighted that Dr. Sharam Dana, Senior Lecturer in International Law at Griffith University, will deliver uh, Carolyn's welcome uh, to you all. Australia. Curtin offered him command of all forces in Australia. In the expectation that MacArthur would be better able to secure reinforcements and provide more opportunities for a fuller say. MacArthur set up his Southwest Pacific Command in Melbourne and then transferred to Brisbane on the 23rd of July after the Battle of Midway. The building which he was in is actually still uh, in the CBD. You can go and see it if you wish. Uh, it and now houses the Apple uh, store. Um, 1942 also marked the complete independence of Australia's foreign affairs and defense uh, when Australia adopted the statute of Westminster through the Act of Parliament, which received royal assent on October 1942. Interestingly enough, it was backdated to September 1st 1939, just before the outbreak of World War II in Europe. On the 3rd of September, Sir Robert Menzies uh, had famously said, it is my melancholy duty to inform you officially that in consequence of the persistence by Germany in the invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her, and that, as a result, Australia is also at war. On, uh, uh, Mr. Now. John Wright to make some opening remarks. Uh, this is a joint effort between Griffith and the um, uh, and the MacArthur Museum, which I'm proud to be a, uh, a, a member of the board. Uh, I won't I won't say. Good morning, a lot ladies and gentlemen. Um, tomorrow, as mentioned, marks the 80th anniversary of the arrival of General Douglas MacArthur in Brisbane to establish his headquarters in what was then the AMP building. His office, his office on the eighth floor at 201 MacArthur, uh, sorry, Edward Street, is now preserved as part of a museum dedicated to the history of Brisbane at war. For pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for today, uh, the professor, the Honourable Bob Carr, Again, the thing is that uh, independence we can take upon ourselves within the context of our alliance relationship. I support the alliance. It's a sensible position for a middle power located as Australia is. It gives us a sharper edge in the international personality we project. It gives us influence in Washington and you could say in some European capitals we wouldn't otherwise have armed neutrality is the alternative is to make the case for that to the Australian people. They want overwhelmingly an alliance relationship with a great and powerful friend. It's embedded in Australian thinking. I don't have to dwell on that. But right now, we face this challenge. Hugh White, in his recent essay, put it bluntly and coldly. A war between America and China means a phone call to Canberra taking our assistance for granted and simply seeking to determine how big our contribution will be. Um, now, our first speaker is Professor Peter Dean, who is the Director of the University of Western Australia Defence and Security Program. Our second speaker, so I'm not going to be running up and interrupting it, you'll know it's like a tag team. When um, Professor Dean finishes, um, he'll be joint, he'll be um, replaced at the microphone by Lieutenant General Retired, it's a bit like us really, Retired, John Sanderson, who is the former head of the UN forces in Cambodia, the Chief of Army and the Western Australian Governor for, where are you, uh, how many terms, Governor? Six years, survivor, well done, yes. So, and our third speaker is Miss Danielle Chubb, who's the founding member of the Polis Group in the Alpha Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalisation at Deakin University, so. A formal alliance between the United States and Australia. And during this period, Australian-US interests in the Indo-Pacific region and globally have been tied together by geography, 
intelligence and security cooperation, economics, the support of liberal democracy, and what is known as a rules-based global order. Over time, this relationship has been one of the closest alliances in modern times, ranging from the Five Eyes Intelligence Cooperation to combined military operations in Korea, South Vietnam, the Persian Gulf, Iraq and Afghanistan. Today, thousands of US and Australian personnel serve on operations, exchange in liaison and staff positions in each other's militaries, including, as Bob mentioned, an Australian Army General who serves as the Deputy Commander US States, United States Army Pacific. To many, the US-Australian alliance was forged in the dark days of the Pacific War and has continued ever since. This special relationship, it is called, is founded on a mutual understanding of two roughly similar societies, both once colonies of Great Britain, aligned by similar frontier foundation myths, as well as complementary values in culture, who were driven together by an assault by imperialist Japan. This notion has become a part of the alliance mythology. The starting point of this relationship is seen by many to be the 27th of December 1941, when, as it was discussed this morning, Curtin said those famous words, without any inhibitions of any kind, I make it quite clear to the Australia looks of America, three of any pangs to our traditional links or kinship with the United Kingdom. Now, ever since Curtin wrote these immortal words, Australian Prime Ministers and the United States Presidents have spoken of the long and enduring friendship between Australia and the United States and the development of this relationship through war. However, in the period up to the Second World War, there was no significant military contact between these two nations. Despite the oratory of contemporary political leaders, it is important to remember that there was no alliance in 1942. There had been no mutual defence planning in the lead up to the war, no joint exercises and little work on interoperability, if at all. When the South West Pacific Area Command was set up in 1942, it was not an alliance, but rather a coalition. That is a temporary ad hoc arrangement united against a specified enemy. The alliance that the Australian public and politicians on both sides of the Pacific like to recall did not form until the signing of the formal treaty in 1951. And even then it was be years before it matured into an important strategic partnership for both countries. In fact, it was not until 1964 that an Australian strategic basis policy document called this relationship Australia's most important strategic partnership. Now, what emerges from the investigation of the wartime coalition is that it's fundamentally ad hoc, profoundly asymmetrical, and deeply dominated by US Army General Douglas MacArthur. The dominance of MacArthur is reflected in my title of my paper today, and I chose that deliberately, not because of his infamous persona and name recognition, but mainly because he was the dominating force and personality in the theater. As it will be revealed, it was his coalition, it was forged and evolved under his leadership, and ultimately it operated on his terms. Now, traditionally, there is a greater emphasis on the smaller power to manage a coalition in order to exert its authority and to influence the dominant power. As the great international affairs scholar Coral Bell wrote in her treatise on the US-Australian Alliance Dependent Ally, the patron is high on the client's horizon the client, except in special circumstances, is low on the patron's horizon. As such, the Australian government and military were heavily focused on managing the coalition with the United States. MacArthur, however, could afford a much more narrow view concentrated on US national priorities, or in fact, MacArthur's own personal priorities, especially from late 1943, when the US forces in the theater became predominant. With a major inequity in strategic power between the two countries, when strategic interests and objectives were mutually aligned, as they were in 42 and 43, there was an exceptionally high degree of cooperation, especially at the operational and tactical levels. It was only after the true asymmetry of the relationship became apparent and that strategic interests started to diverge that the relationship became strategically and operationally dysfunctional in the last year of the war. Ultimately, however, it could, should be noted that this was a successful coalition. Despite its ad hoc nature, it was victorious in defeating the Japanese in the theatre, and this is highlighted by the triumphs in battle that the Allies had. It is, however, worth exploring in some more detail how MacArthur's command and leadership operated in Australia, and how we can reflect on lessons Australia can, has used and has tried to use as it later forged one of the closest alliances in the world today. Now, to go back to March of 1942, MacArthur received a directive from the US Joint Chiefs of Staff outlining his command and responsibilities. That made him supreme commander of all Allied forces in the area, irrespective of nationality from which they derived. 
although it did note that he was not, quote, eligible to command directly any national force. To carry out his mission, MacArthur set up General Headquarters, GHQ, to command and exercise authority in the theatre. And despite orders to the contrary, all senior officers appointed to GHQ were American, and all but three had been with MacArthur in the Philippines. MacArthur's refusal to budge on this issue meant that his headquarters would stand in stark contrast to the approach Eisenhower would take when he established Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force to command the European theatre of operations. So the Australian Air Force, Navy and Army, it was an inauspicious start to their relationship with their new Commander-in-Chief. Underneath GHQ, MacArthur had three senior combatant commanders, a commander of Allied Naval Forces, Air Forces and Land Forces. The first two were placed under US officers, Admiral Herbert F. Leary and Lieutenant General George Brett in the first instance, and, uh, and the Australian General Sir Thomas Blamey, who the Australian government had only recently ordered back from the Middle East and made Commander-in-Chief of the Australian Military Forces became the Land Forces com Combatant Commander. All, these national all national contingents would come under the command of these three services, at least for the first year of the war, until MacArthur found a way around that as well. Now, MacArthur recalled in his memoirs on arrival in Australia that he, quote, replaced the pessimism of failure with the inspiration of success. What the Australians needed was a strategy that held out the promise of victory. The Australian Chiefs of Staff had been thinking and planning only defensively behind this so-called Brisbane line, a concept that was purely of passive defence and I felt would result only in eventual defeat. I decided to abandon the pan completely, to move a thousand miles forward to the eastern Papua and to stop the Japanese on the rough mountains of the Owen Stanley Range of New Guinea, to make a fight for Australia beyond its own borders. And the decision gave the Australians an exhilarating lift. Now, this recollection contains nothing more than a small kernel of truth hidden behind a fabricated reality. In Australian parlance, it's bullshit. Like much, if not all, of MacArthur's writing, press statements and announcements, it was part of a carefully orchestrated propaganda campaign aimed at unabashed self-promotion. The Australian Chiefs of Staff and General Brett, the American General Brett, and the Australian government's appreciations of the strategic situation in February and March of 42 were based on the premise of the development of Australia as a base for offensive operations against Japan. As David Horner and a number of other writers have demonstrated comprehensively, there was no Brisbane line, and efforts had been underway before MacArthur arrived to prepare in Papua for defence against the Japanese. In fact, shortly after his arrival, MacArthur accepted virtually all of the strategic assessments of the Australian Chiefs of Staff. The major difference between MacArthur's assessments and the Australians was that GHQ believed that the Japanese would soon attack Darwin with three divisions, while the Australians correctly assessed they would focus their attack on Papua and Port Moresby. Now, after making his way to Melbourne in southern Australia, MacArthur addressed a knot of reporters who he had gathered to greet him, and John mentioned this this morning. The President of the United States ordered me to break through the Japanese lines and proceed from Corregidor to Australia for the purpose, as I understand it, of organising an American offensive against Japan, the primary objective which is the relief of the Philippines. I came through and I shall return. Now this statement is fascinating in what it reveals about MacArthur's intentions, makes no mention of Australia other than the fact the President ordered him there, paid no heed to the security of the defence of the nation which then him standing, and he spoke only of an American offensive rather than an Allied one. In his memoirs, MacArthur recalled upon arrival that, quote, as quickly as possible I arranged a conference with the Australian Prime Minister John Curtin. I put my arm about his strong shoulder and said, I'll see this thing through together. We can do it and we will do it. You take care of the rear and I will handle the front. Now MacArthur's recollection is indicative of his personality and reputation as one of the more colourful officers in US military history. Lieutenant Colonel Gerard Wilkinson, the British liaison officer at the Southwest Pacific headquarters, described him as, quote, shrewd, proud, remote, highly strung and vastly vain. He has imagination, self-confidence, physical courage and charm, but no humour about himself, no regard at all to the truth, and is completely unaware of these defects. He, makes emotion, he mistakes emotions and ambitions for principles, and with moral depth he would be a great man, but as it is, he's a near miss, which may be worse than a mile. <laughs> 
MacArthur's Air Force Commander, First Air Force Commander, Lieutenant General Brett, described him as, quote, a brilliant temperamental egotist, a handsome man who can be as charming as anyone who ever lived or as harshly indifferent to the needs and desires of those around him. His religion is deeply a part of his nature, and everything about MacArthur is on a grand scale. His virtues, his triumph, his intellect, and his shortcomings. Now, MacArthur and the Australian Prime Minister John Curtin would have formed an exceptionally close and mutually supportive relationship over the next two years. Curtin, a Labor, Prime, Labor Party Prime Minister and former trade union official, had little experience in military affairs. And the great irony of the MacArthur-Curtin relationship was that it was between a left-wing, almost socialist Australian Prime Minister and an ardent conservative Republican-American general, unlikely collaborators at the best of times. Recollections of the Curtin-MacArthur relationship note a number of important characteristics. Curtin is often represented as a leader heavily pressured by the burden of his wartime role, and this has been reinforced by the fact that, like President Roosevelt, he died in office in 1945, just before the war ended. Curtin is often portrayed as an admirable man who worked judiciously to achieve the best outcome for his country while the nation was on the back foot, as one of Australia's greatest, if not greatest, ever Prime Minister. However, that representation of working judiciously and working hard but in the shadow of MacArthur is one that is noted of Australian weakness and incompetence versus American strength. Now, MacArthur's arrival in Melbourne and later his move here to Brisbane heralded a major change in the dynamics of the way Australian strategy was made. The Australian command structure was completely reversed and where previously the Australian Chiefs of Staff had been the principal advisor to the government, they were now replaced by a foreign general and their role became more administrative. MacArthur took over all operational control of the Australian forces in the region and was directly responsible for the defence of the continent. Most significantly, Curtin, supported by his Secretary of Defence, Frederick Shedden, looked to MacArthur as the main source of strategic advice for the government. And as David Horner has noted, in placing Australian forces under MacArthur, the Australian federal government surrendered a large measure of sovereignty. But considering the Australia's limited strength and the magnitude of the Japanese threat at the time, Curtin had no alternative. Now, prior to the arrival of MacArthur, the Australian government had valiantly pressed the case to be involved in the highest levels of authority for the setting of strategy for the war in the Pacific. As a very minor power, however, dependent, anxious and insecure, Australia found it difficult to influence high policy. It meant that, as Geoffrey Searle has noted, it's probably futile to deplore the loss of Australian sovereignty and the subservience involved in placing MacArthur in his command position. In particular, command arrangements and the relationship between Curtin and MacArthur developed in a manner which they did as a result of Australia's desire to influence strategic decision-making in the Pacific War. Australian representation had been excluded from the combined Chiefs of Staff, and there was no Australian representative on the US Joint Chiefs. Thus, the Australian government were looking for a way to influence Allied grand strategy. Some input had been possible via their representations on the Pacific War Council. However, it was made clear as to what would happen, it was not made clear as to what would happen to the views of the Australians or any other member if they disagreed with the British, American, or combined Chiefs of Staff. So the Australian government was very skeptical of this approach. In its final form, the Pacific War Council, which was established in March of 42, um, was divided after the Pacific was divided into British and US commands. The purpose was to give advice to the Joint Chiefs of Staff about setting strategic policy. And it was hopefully that they were, the joint, US Joint Chiefs would take direction from that council, but in fact the reverse happened. While the Pacific War Council did provide Australia, New Zealand and the Dutch with a voice, it could only take, recommend, make recommendations to the JCF who largely ignored them. The British Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax, thought the council was, quote, merely a facade. And Christopher Horne has noted that the US Joint Chiefs of Staff did not attend the meetings and that the council had no bearing on decision making whatsoever. Now, as a result of this council being only advisory, the Secretary of Defence in Australia, Frederick Shedden, believed the only way Australia could influence Allied strategy in the Pacific was to use MacArthur's access to the Joint Chiefs through General Marshall. And this path would be highly dependent, therefore, on the relationship between MacArthur and Curtin. So it was fortuitous then, from the time of MacArthur's arrival in March of 42, that MacArthur won the trust and confidence of the Australian government. MacArthur would call Curtin the heart and soul of Australia and recalled in his memoirs that he developed with the Prime Minister a sense of mutual trust, cooperation and regard that was never once breached by word, thought or deed. Curtin would be one of MacArthur's staunchest political allies in the war, 
and together they campaigned earnestly and relentlessly through any channels available to garner more resources for Australia and for the theatre. Now, under this arrangement, the entire strategic decision-making structure in Australia was recast. As noted, McCarthy became the principal strategic advisor to the Prime Minister. This, and the body established to coordinate this decision-making process was the Prime Minister's War Conference. And that body consisted only of the Prime Minister and MacArthur, and such ministers and officers as the Prime Minister might decide to summon to attend. This decision was cemented MacArthur's position as the main and virtually sole military advisor to the Australian head of government. This Prime Minister's War Conference would be the mainspring of machinery for the higher direction of the war, and besides MacArthur and Curtin, the only other person to attend every single meeting was the Secretary of Defence, Frederick Shedden. So this triumvirate of Curtin, MacArthur and Shedden represented the consolidation of strategic policy-making power in Australia in 1942 and 1943. This was recognition of Curtin's approach by MacArthur and a clear set of limitations, sorry, there was also recognition by Curtin of MacArthur's clear limitations he set about this coalition. The Supreme Commander made it clear that Australia's turn to America was only temporary and specifically related to the defeat of Japan. The day after, as it was mentioned this morning, the, uh, the sub midget submarine raid on Sydney Harbour, MacArthur made the following statement that Shedden wrote down during the triumvirate's meeting. That the Commander-in-Chief desired to point out the distinctions between the United States and the United Kingdom and their relations and responsibilities to Australia, sentiment by ties of blood, sentiment and allegiance to the Crown. The United States was an ally whose aim was to win the war and it had no sovereign interest in the integrity of Australia. In fact, in view of the strategical importance of Australia in the war with Japan, America's involvement there and this course of military action will probably be followed irrespective of the American relationship to whomever might be occupying Australia. The limitations of the relationship would remain present during the course of the war. And while Australia and MacArthur's strategic interests coincided, the system that worked around this war conference worked exceptionally effectively. But cracks would appear in late 1943 as the relative weight of the two, or the military forces in the two countries in the theatre changed, and MacArthur's plans and Australia's interests started to diverge. Despite these changes, there would be no move to alter the setup for the higher direction of the war, even though the Prime Minister's War Conference would meet far less frequently and MacArthur's concern for Australia's perspective on strategy would rapidly diminish. In September of 44, MacArthur left Brisbane and was never to return. And as the geographical distance between him and the continent grew, he became less and less interested in Australia and its military forces. The events of 1945 revealed the difficulties for a minor power like Australia to carve out a strategy in, for itself in the face of the deliberations of major powers. In the end, the British and the US came to a mutually agreeable strategic solution to the British involvement in the Pacific War that suited their strategic interests and did nothing towards the needs of Australia. This meant that Australia's Imperial Force spent much of 1944 on the sidelines of the war and when launched into battle in 1945 took part in a campaign in Borneo that was strategically and operationally irrelevant to the outcome of the war. Now MacArthur had deliberately sought to exclude the Australians from major operations in the last part of the war, but the strong bond he had formed with Curtin and the government in the early part of the war had been predicated, however, on MacArthur's self-interest rather than the interests of Australia or a mutually beneficial alliance. This also reinforced the importance of basing true alliance relationships on more than transactional needs during wartime and that such relations cannot be um, based on specific personalities. Rather, a broad alignment of strategic interests and objectives are critical, and these should form the basis of much deeper levels of engagement at the strategic, operational and tactical levels. As a result of the wartime experience, when Australia did form an alliance with the United States in 1951, it worked assiduously to ensure that it had direct access to the US Joint Chiefs of Staff and the highest levels of US strategic planning, as well as forming our closest possible relationship with the senior US officer in Hawaii. All of these measures were rebuffed in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. Australia had wanted to put a senior officer inside the JCS and wanted a US, an Australian embedding Pacific Command, but it was not until the early 2010s that these ambitions were realised. The other key fact in the wartime coalition was not only mutually aligned strategic interests that matter, but so does geography. During the Cold War, Australia was a strategic backwater for much of the time as the US tried to stay disengaged from Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. 
But now Australia's tyranny of distance has been replaced by the power of proximity to the world's most important strategic region. And with that comes both opportunities and risks. So the takeaways are simple. Geography, sovereignty and interests matter much more than values and personality. The latter are important, but they are no substitute for clear structures of command, clear processes of strategic policy making, and most significantly, a focus on where strategic interests do and do not align. Thank you. All right, so my work on public opinion is motivated by the central principle that foreign and defence policy shouldn't be considered an elite domain, right, that's disconnected from the lives of everyday people. Actually, on the contrary, I believe that how a state pursues these policies does have real implications for the lives of everyday people. So understanding public opinion is crucial because it tells us something important about the ideas and the values that animate a society's internal debates about two important things. Firstly, the character of the national interest that the government of the day continually professes to pursue, and that's not fixed in stone, that changes. It's a, it's a, it's a changing beast that, that morphs over time. And also, it says something about how a society wishes to allocate its resources. And so, when we look at um, Australian public opinion towards the US alliance, from the, from the public's perspective, the US alliance is one of the most well understood and best recognised aspects of Australian defence policy. It attracts regular media discussion and attention, particularly through frequent events like OSMIN, joint military exercises, visits by heads of state and other officials, and at times of crisis, of course, it comes to the fore. And we saw that back in 2001 when you started to see ANZUS being talked about in the media for perhaps the first time in a long time, this, this acronym that the Australian public more broadly started to, to be exposed to. And of course, it's also true that at times of crisis or at times where our commitment to the alliance involves um, contributions such as troop deployments, having the support uh, and the backing of the Australian public is, is fundamental. You need that or you can't send your, your women and your men abroad. So. The research I've been doing is, is based on a book I published last year with Professor Ian McAllister at the Australian National University. And it looks at public opinion towards Australian foreign defence policy since the end of World War II. And it was really an opportune time to do this because we're, for the first time we had this mass of data. So advances in public opinion, uh, in polling on public opinion has allowed us to write this book. Before the late 1980s, defence and foreign affairs topics were rarely included uh, in commercial polls. And where they were, the coverage was sporadic, survey questions weren't repeated, we couldn't get a sense of kind of a how opinion was changing over time. Because, you know, we asked the Australian public just recently, what do you think about AUKUS? But I don't think you can tell much from that one poll, right? You need to have systematic, continual, repeated uh, questions over time to see what the trends are. Um, but since 1987 and the introduction of the Australian Electoral Study Survey, which my um, co-author has been running since that time, and then particularly again since 2005 and the introduction of the annual Lowy Institute survey. So the Australian Electoral Study, uh, some of you may know and some of you may not, it, it polls the full gamut of policy, op opinion towards policy at election time. Um, but the annual Lowy Institute survey is specifically focused on foreign and defence policy and it takes place every year. So now we've got this database on public opinion available for secondary analysis. And so for the first time, uh, we're able to write this book showing, um, gi giving a systematic study of longitudinal um, trends in public opinion and foreign affairs. So I'm going to just today, in the time I've got allotted to me, share with you some of what we know about what Australians think about the US alliance. So two of the key findings of this data are that over the past 70 years, we've seen um, a lot, first of all, that we've seen strong and persistent public support. This is what we would, would call in the public opinion space, it almost comes to a valence issue, which means that it's an issue on which virtually everyone is agreed. Um, there's a general consensus among Australians, first that defence is important, and there's a general agreement that Australia would be unable to mount a serious defence without significant um, external assistance, as we've heard discussed today in the history of um, Australia's relationship with great and powerful friends. And so in this context, a defence alliance with the United States of America receives overwhelming public support. 
Thank you for a fascinating and um, clear-minded and moderate perspective this afternoon. It was really interesting. Um, our next speaker is Sonia Arakal, and um, she is a policy fellow at the Perth US Asia Centre, where she directs the centre's India programs and supports policy development through publication and advisory work. Her foreign policy commentary has been featured in the local and international press, including in The Australian and The Age. And today she's going to be speaking about India's approach to strategic autonomy, lessons for Australia. Thank you, Sonia. Well, as Dr Chubb said, foreign policy should reflect our national character. And as generations emerge, they play a larger role in, in, in shaping our national character. Well, when it comes to Australia's emerging view on the alliance, um, young Australians' emerging views, I'd make three observations. While overall polling in Australia shows support for the alliance, the latest Lowy poll did find a significant generational divide. Australians under 30 are less likely to trust the United States and more likely to believe the alliance is less important because the United States is in decline. Now, Dr. Chubb mentioned that this may not have longevity. It, it could be a life cycle uh, force as opposed to one that will live with this generation um, into their old age. But I would note that the latest census data shows that the millennial generation is becoming the nation's largest, displacing the post-war baby boomers. This means for at least in this point in time, at this point in the life cycle, the salience of their views on the alliance matters. From my own personal experience, I came of age in the late 90s and early 2000s and have a very different view. Unlike the generation before me, um, I have not seen the US lead during a time of unprecedented economic growth and relative stability. Rather, I grew up on the war on terror, the global financial crisis, and President Trump. My second observation would be, there seems to be a tension um, in our foreign policy between an increased willingness to identify increasingly as more Asian while doubling down or retreating to the Anglosphere. Caroline, Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, in her introductory video this week, you know, roused solidarity for um, the alliance by appealing to the fact that, and I quote, our parents and grandparents fought side by side for more than 100 years. Mine didn't. And for a growing... <laughs> did fight with the British, but not the Americans. Um, and for a growing proportion of Australians, this has also not been their experience. Indians moving to Australia were the largest overseas migrant cohort in the past decade and have supplanted China as the second biggest diaspora living in Australia. Of course, becoming more Asian doesn't mean becoming more accepting of Chinese influence in the region. China awareness is inherent part of being Asian. 